All right, Dan, I think you get to take it away. Okay, great. Well, thank you both Cinnamon and Will. And yeah, you know, wish I could be there in person to uh, meet all of you, but uh, this will have to do for now until I can make it down there uh, some other time. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so excited to be here today. Um, I think, uh, well, hopefully this will be interesting. So what I'm going to be talking about today is, as the title implies, the, uh, the regional effects of marine protected areas. And I'll get into defining that in a bit here. Um, and in particular today, we're going to focus in on kind of the population level regional effects of marine protected areas. They'll also talk about the fishery effects briefly. Um, before, we, before we get going here, um, so this is a manuscript that's in prep. It's been kind of in the review limbo for almost a year now, which is always fun. Um, but this is a manuscript loosely titled Assessing the Population Level Conservation Effects of Marine Protected Areas. And this is a collaboration with myself. Uh, Jen Cassell, Chris Costello, Olivier Deschenes, Steve Gaines, Ray Hilborn, and Owen Liu. Most of those are down at UC Santa Barbara, except for Ray, who's up here with uh, the University of Washington. All right, so without further ado, let's get going then. So, oh, acknowledgments, this part's very important. Um, just to get the stuff out in front here, um, this work was funded by uh, the NIMP Sea Grant Population Ecosystem Dynamics Fellowship. Uh, the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, uh, PISCO, the Partnership for Interdisciplinary Studies of Coastal Oceans, um, California Ocean Protection Council, and California Sea Grant. A lot of these funders kind of made the raw data collection possible. They didn't necessarily fund, you know, this particular paper, but I want to acknowledge that support there. And then, you know, critically here, um, we're going to be talking a lot about empirical data here, and that obviously depends on folks who do the hard work of getting under the water and diving and actually counting these fish. I want to call those folks out in particular. Uh, Catherine uh, Davis Cohen and Avery Parsons Field. All right, so marine protected areas. Um, why should we care about them? Well, the most obvious example, right, is they can create a lot of fish. All right, this is a video from a marine protected area in Indonesia. And for those of you who've been diving in, in, in Indonesia, I can, you'll certainly agree, and I can certainly tell you if not, this is not what reefs close to, you know, heavy amounts of fishing look like. Right, so kind of the simple reason why we should care about marine protected areas is that, well, you know, if we enforce them well and they're big enough and they're put into a place where fishing would have been intense otherwise, it's pretty safe to assume that if you kill less fish and you provide adequate protection, you'll get a lot more fish inside the marine protected area in the long run. So that's pretty obvious and nice and straightforward. Um, and I think, you know, if that were the only thing we cared about is kind of, you know, how do we measure and protect these populations inside these protected areas? That would you know, be a fairly simple question. Where it gets more kind of complicated and for me interesting is thinking about how do we place marine protected areas in the context of both conservation needs and human uses. So this is a community we were working with in the Philippines that was you know, obviously very dependent on fishery resources and was trying to count on some local marine protected areas as one of their main fishery management strategies, right? And so now the question becomes a bit more complicated. It's not just, well, yeah, if we close off an area, we should get more fish inside there. It's starting to think about how do we design marine protected areas in a way that balance this trade-off between providing conservation gains both inside and hopefully outside of their borders, and also providing enough opportunity, economic and fishing opportunity, for the communities that depend on them. And, and that's where it gets tricky. And that's where this question of regional effects becomes really critical. So with that in mind then though, let's take a step back and remember you know, that marine protected areas are not some kind of newfangled contraption that we came up with in the last 40 years, right? Various cultures all around the world have used some form of marine protected area um, in some form or another for about as long as we, we know these things. Um, now, in many cases, these were, you know, temporary fish banks, if you will, where places would get closed off and then opened up again at times of need. But the point is they've been used for a long time. This isn't a new and untested idea. Lots of communities stumbled across the idea that, hey, if we stop fishing in some places, we might get benefits in the long term. But more recently, right, we're starting to really scale up this idea of marine protected areas as a part of kind of global ocean management. Um, so this is a map I pulled in from um, the MPA Atlas, I believe. Um, don't click that. Um, and these green areas here are what they classify on the map as highly protected reserves, and all these blue areas are some form of MPA. 
And the takeaway here is, right, you know, relative, if you looked at this map 20 years ago, it would have looked a lot different, a lot smaller, right? And now, depending on how you count the area protected, that number is still pretty small, right? These blue areas, about 5.3% of the oceans, 2.5 for the green areas. So, you know, 7 point, you know, eight or so, if you kind of count all of them as some form of MPA. And growing up from that target, the, um, I never know how to pronounce this, that HE target 11 calls for 10% protection by 2020, which is already 2020 right now, so I guess we're not quite there. And more recently, the IUCN has approved a resolution to move for 30% by 2030, all right? So one way or another, we're talking about kind of dramatically expanding the role that marine protected areas are kind of tasked with for global ocean management. And part of the reason for this, I think, is that there's been kind of this emerging, I don't know if consensus is the word, but viewpoint in a lot of cases that I think is nicely summarized in, um, in this NPR article from September 2018. So this is from the SALT. And it was in reference to a paper that I believe actually, yeah, one of Chris Costello and um, uh, Crow White's papers looking at a ban on fishing international waters. But one of the leading sentences from this NPR article is this, the jury is in on marine reserves. They work. Research has repeatedly shown that fish numbers quickly climb following well-enforced fishing bans, creating tangible benefits for fishers who work the surrounding waters. Right, so that kind of says it all, right? The jury is in. And so naturally we should start thinking about expanding these things and kind of saying, great, let's use these to now manage fisheries across the world and marine resources across the world. And what I wanna kind of spend some time evaluating today is whether this is actually true. And the, what I'm going to posit here is that we need to call the jury back. And in fact, when we start to think about the regional effects of marine protected areas, not just inside their borders, but how they affect populations and fisheries, the results are gonna be much more context dependent and much more harder to detect than what we've kind of, maybe conventional wisdom has kind of suggested. So with that in mind, then, let's think a little bit about what is it that we expect to get from marine protected areas. And we can loosely break this into kind of an inside and outside effect. Right, inside is pretty straightforward. And this is in many ways very analogous to kind of protected areas on land, terrestrial systems, you know, Kruger National Park, Yellowstone, where we protect an area with the goal of protecting the things inside. Of it, right? And so inside a reserve, we might expect increased abundance, biomass and biodiversity protection of critical and essential habitats, insurance against what's going on outside, whether that be poor management, um, you know, maybe to the extent that they increase resilience, even climate change, um, using them as a kind of laboratory of unfished conditions to get a sense for what these ecosystems might look like without fishing, and of course, economic benefits from tourism. But recently, right, we've started to focus a lot more, not just on these inside benefits, but on these outside benefits. This idea that first marine protected areas might be able to reseed overfished areas outside of their borders by larvae, right? So even if you fished a ton of the species on outside, maybe larvae from inside the reserve can migrate outside, settle, and provide fishing and conservation opportunities outside. And similarly, maybe once adult biomass builds up a lot inside the reserves, these, um, the biomass can start to migrate outside the reserves, again, providing conservation and fishing opportunities. And as a result, right, we see a lot of talk of marine protected areas as kind of this potential win-win, where in some circumstances, you might be able to, by closing off fishing in some areas, in the long term, provide gains both to conservation and through spillover, actually increased fishing opportunity as well. So that's kind of what I would call the, you know, at least a rough summary of the laundry list of things we might want from marine protected areas, right? And so what I'm going to dig into today is kind of focus in on some of these key questions of particularly if we're looking both inside and outside, what should we actually expect the regional effect of marine protected areas to be? And we're gonna use theory to kind of dig into that for a bit. But then we're gonna spend a bit more time with this question of how do we actually go about detecting those effects? And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some problems with current common empirical methods for doing this, present an alternative and kind of demonstrate that alternative with the Channel Islands Marine Protected Area System. Um, so with that introduction kind of out of the way then, let's get going. So let's think first from a theory-based perspective, just what should we actually expect marine protected areas to do at the regional scale? 
And to ground this, then, let's put this in the context of a system that is near and dear to my heart, um, the Santa Barbara Channel here. So for those of you who haven't spent time in there, this is the Santa Barbara Channel in kind of Southern to Central California, depending on who you ask. Um, and what we're focusing on here is the Channel Islands, uh, this area down here. And each of these gray boxes is a marine protected area, most of which were put in place in 2003. And so the key question that we want to think about today is basically when these marine protected areas got put in place, these gray boxes here, what happened throughout the system? What happened to the Channel Islands? Both in terms of the population of fishes that live there and the fishing opportunities uh, present within those islands. Right, since with a lot of the fisheries that we're talking about here, you know, we don't think that there, there is an isolated population of let's say blue rockfish that lives around Santa Cruz Island there, right? You know, the stock assessment for this species runs basically the entire California to Oregon coast. And so instead, what we're thinking about is, well, these marine protected areas are providing protection to some portion of a bigger population, a biological stock that's connected by larval dispersal and adult movement, right? And basically, the smaller that larval and adult movement is relative to the size of that marine protected area, kind of the bigger proportional effect we would expect to see, right? And so when I'm talking about regional effects here, this is more or less what I'm talking about. And we're going to focus mostly, again, on this talk on the biomass question. So in a perfect world, right, this is an experiment we might like to see. So on the y-axis here, we have total biomass of a population. On the x-axis, we have number of years with the marine protected area. And you can see the marine protected area goes in place in year zero, where that red vertical dashed line is. And so in this situation, we started off at some carrying capacity, we start fishing that population down, and eventually, you know, becomes very, very overfished over time. And then if we were able to put this perfect experiment in place, where then say we protect 25% of that population's range, the entire area of that population inside a marine protected area, we start to see some divergence, right? We see that with the MPAs, we start to get a little bit more biomass. And as we increase the size of that MPA, we get a lot more biomass. And so when I say a regional population effect, what I'm talking about here is the magnitude of that wedge between the world without MPAs and the world with MPAs. Right? So what does theory tell us should matter from a conservation perspective? Right? And you know, Will has done a lot of work on this, as have a lot of other folks who um, are associated with the departments up there. But broadly, right, you know, there's a lot of things that can go in here, but we can certainly think of a critical one being, well, the MPA size relative to the dispersal of both adults and larvae. We can think about kind of the structure of the MPA network itself and the ability of different marine protected areas to serve as kind of islands and hot and uh, jumping off points for different species questions about this, both the strength and timing of density dependence. Does it happen within the reserves themselves or kind of in a global competitive field within the water column? And then of course, critical questions about fishing behavior and management, right? How heavy was fishing in the first place and how do fishing fleets respond to uh, protected areas, right? Do they leave the fishery entirely or do they just, if they used to fish inside the MPA, do they just move outside the and then, of course, there are really complicated things like trophic cascades and habitat effects that we're probably not going to get into here, but which certainly do come into effect. And so that's the basic question of if we just want to ask, you know, how much is that MPA going to benefit conservation? Right? Those are some of the key factors inside there. From a fishing perspective, it's a little different, right? We need to think about, well, from a basic perspective, is there overfishing in the first place? And it matters a lot whether or not that overfishing is growth overfishing or recruitment overfishing. Are we running out of big fish or are we running out of new recruits? And then we need to think about kind of this Goldilocks factor of the ratio of kind of closing off enough areas to create spillover and create conservation gains while leaving enough open to facilitate fishing opportunities outside. And then of course we need to think about fleet behavior and one of the biggest ones being basically should they stay or should they go? Right? Should fishing effort be modeled or does it in fact just displace or leave when you put a marine protected area? And of course, we need to think about the time scale in place here, right? Are we talking about benefits in 50 years, but costs for the first 30 years? Or are we talking about immediate benefits? 
So the point of all this is to say that there's a lot of work that's been done in this field and a lot of theory that's kind of gone into thinking about when things might, rain protected areas might benefit conservation and when they might benefit fisheries. And so what we wanted to do is ask, well, if we're thinking about a system like the Channel Islands, what should we expect to happen? And so what we did is basically built a fairly simple model, which is just an age structured single species population model that is explicit in space that allows us to kind of build in a lot of these things that theory says should be important into one cohesive model. And now we can start to kind of vary all these levers together and ask ourselves basically if we have a species that looks like this and de but density dependence looks like this and it moves like that, but the fleet does that and the NPA is designed like that, what does the world look like with marine protected areas and what does it look like without, right? So we ran a bunch of simulations and they look about like this. Right, so what these kind of radar animations are showing us is in black, that's the expected biomass in space that we would have um, in the world without marine protected areas in that experiment. And then the colored areas are what happens to that experiment when we apply marine protected areas to it, where the blue areas are marine protected areas and the red areas are fished areas. Right, and then on the other side there, we can see the trajectories of expected biomass catch, effort and profits that would result from that MPA experiment. Right? So you can see here, right, a couple things. We can see that, you know, in this particular case, right, we got a big biomass win for this marine protected area, but we saw pretty substantial or fisheries loss from this marine protected area. And we can also see that as we might expect, right, the marine protected areas have the biggest effect inside their borders, but they also affect areas outside their borders, right? We see that, you know, in some cases, we start to actually get a little bit less fishing bi or biomass in the areas outside the reserves, near the reserves as fishing effort concentrates outside there and things like that. So the point of all this model is again for context, to ask ourselves before we go out and try and measure anything in the field, what do we observe? Right. And so let's take a step back and see what those simulation results tell us. So what we're looking at here, this is the median population level effect caused by the MPA in the simulations as a function of pre-MPA depletion on the x-axis and the size of the MPA, the percent of the population's range that's in the MPA on the y-axis. Okay. And the color then is that median effect. So the, the important thing to note here is that, you know, as you might expect, small MPAs have small population effects. There's no big surprise there. And then, you know, as you increase that MPA size, you get bigger and bigger effects, especially once the population was going to be really overfished in the first place. None of that should be surprising to anybody. The kind of interesting thing to note, though, is that if we kind of look down at that level of about, well, a lot of marine protected areas, I think myself and my co-authors would argue, fall kind of closer to that 25% range for a lot of species. Um, if we look across that, we can see that you have to be pretty overfished, you know, down to a pre-MPA depletion of around 75% or more, which depending on how you want to measure B over BMSY might be about, you know, 0.3 to 0.4 to 1, depending on how where it goes, B over BMSY, before you start to see a population effect that's much bigger than, let's say, 25%. And let's think about that for a second. 25% sounds kind of big. But if you think about it, that's actually kind of a small effect size if we're talking about trying to go out into a messy, complicated ecosystem and measure this stuff in the field, especially less so once things get much lower than that. And what we can also look at though is that's the median effect size. We can kind of flip these things on their axes and now look at kind of the range of possible outcomes. So now what we've got on the x-axis is the pre-MPA depletion or the range in the marine protected area and on the y-axis, the population effect, and the color is the density of simulations. And so what I want you to take home from this is just that even for a given, let's say, pre-MPA depletion of 50%, you could expect anything from an actual net conservation loss, which we'll talk about in a second here, to a very tiny effect size to 100% effect size. And that can increase, you know, as the MPA, the population becomes more and more overfished in the first place, obviously the possibility of a big effect gets higher and higher, but there's still a huge range of possible outcomes there. And a similar story with the size of the marine protected area. Right? So what I want you to take home from all this then is that, you know, far from, again, the jury just kind of being out on what can we expect from marine protected areas, 
we can see that depending on all these kind of characteristics that we're simulating here, you can get very different results. Some good, some small, some even bad. And we don't have time to talk about this, but just to flag it here for a conversation letter. The interesting thing is where those bad results come in, where the MPA actually causes a net conservation loss, is when we have a fleet model that follows what we might call a constant catch scenario. And so the idea here is that instead of a fishing fleet that targets, say, a fixed exploitation rate or profits over the long term, this fishing fleet is saying, I like to try and catch about this much catch every year. This might be because it's a subsistence fishery. This might be because it's a quota constrained fishery with a lot of market demand. But when that happens, if you put a marine protected area in and you don't adjust the quota, you can actually produce a net population level loss in biomass, um, basically because you have to fish the age structure outside the reserve down really hard to keep that catch going. It's an interesting little thing that we can talk about later. We're not gonna focus on the fishery effects here today, but I do wanna just kind of flag this for discussion since I talk a lot about the fishery effects of things. So this is a similar plot to what we saw before. But now we're looking at pre-MPA depletion on the x-axis, range in MPA on the y-axis, and then the median effect in terms of percentage increase in catches in color. And so there's a couple things you can take away from this. One is that, you know, basically until you've got a really, really, really overfished docks, across most of our simulations, it's pretty hard to get a substantial positive effect. In addition, once you get over an MPA size of about 25%, it's pretty easy to cause a, you know, a loss to the fishery. But kind of the good news is for that kind of area where we've talked about, where a lot of MPAs are kind of probably in that 25% range, there's a pretty broad range there where you might be able to get some pretty substantial, you know, 25, 50% conservation gains at fairly minimal fishery costs. Now, you know, we'd love to be able to get a win-win in both. And in a lot of cases, you certainly can. But you know, it's something to keep in mind for you. The last thing that I'll mention a little bit from our simulation results, since I think it ties into some broader research questions that I have, is that you know, we in this fisheries MPA world oftentimes come from an ecological background. And so those are the kind of mechanisms that we think a lot about, larval dispersal and growth rates and density dependence and recruitment shocks. But one thing that we did is basically take our simulation models and then calculate variable importance scores for which kinds of simulation factors had the biggest effect on the conservation, the magnitude of the conservation effect. And you know, the most obvious one is F over M there, fishing mortality rate relative to natural mortality rate. That makes sense. If you're not fishing very hard, you're not gonna have a big effect. But you'll notice that there's a whole bunch of other economic things like what kind of fleet model do you have, what the size limit is and stuff like that, that kind of comes in way before a lot of these things that we spend a lot of time focusing on like larval movement. Now we can, there's a lot of assumptions that go into that, but I just want to flag it that, you know, when we're talking about researching and studying marine protected areas, we have to be thinking about the economic context of these things. How is it affecting fleet dynamics? So I know that was a ton there and I wanna spend more time focused on kind of these empirical results and hopefully some time for discussion here. So some take home message from that simulation study is that first from kind of a positive side of right, the worst things are the more that we think that MPAs can indeed provide this kind of win-win for fisheries and conservation, right? That's good. But we also saw that right again, far from kind of being this closed book of we know exactly what marine protected areas are going to do, even in this kind of simple model, once you start to kind of move around all these theoretical levers, we start to see that there's a lot of possible outcomes from small to big to even negative, depending on the specific context. And what I want to focus on here, though, is that for a lot of kind of moderately sized MPAs and moderately fished species, our prior is probably that we're looking for a smallish effect size, right? Maybe zero to 30%. Which again, that's not saying that's, a, that's not a significant effect from the perspective of the population, but from the perspective of us going out into nature to try and actually study these things and detect these effects, that's actually pretty small. And so let's think about this question now. So we've used theory to say, all right, here's what we kind of think a priori, we would expect the regional population level effects of the marine protected area to be. Now, how should we go about trying to detect those things in the real world? And with that in mind, then let's turn to this graph. So this is from 
Um, a good friend and colleague of mine, Sarah Lester's, Sarah Lester's paper in 2009, which I don't even know how many citations this thing has now a ton. And so what this thing is, was a meta-analysis that they did trying to quantify kind of the, what they were terming, you know, some of the conservation effects of marine protected areas around the world. And every point in this graph is a different study. And the important thing to focus on here is that biomass graph there, right? And so they reported that um, they found uh, biomass effects of these marine protected areas on the order of, I believe that's the, uh, the mean effect of 446% with a median of about 200%, right? So you might be asking, well, okay, how does that jive with what you just said that we should probably expect these MPA effects to be small, right? That seems to say that, well, when we went and looked out in the real world, A, what are you talking about? We don't know what the effects of marine protected areas are. This study has been out there. It's, you know, it's a meta-analysis of hundreds of MPAs and there's more now. They showed a huge effect. What's the issue here, right? And there's a couple factors here. Well, first is that, you know, each of those points is one marine protected area. And so you might say that, well, yeah, there's a huge range in there. We simulated a huge range. And we can't really say within the range of simulations that we did how probable any one of those states of nature is. So maybe it's just that in the real world, a lot of marine protected areas happen to fall in that parameter space that really creates the potential for big effects. The other issue, though, is how we're measuring conservation effects here, right? And this mismatch between how we've commonly measured conservation effects of marine protected areas and how those apply to this question of population level effects. And it comes down to this weird thing in econometrics that we call SIPMA, which is basically the, this idea that the treatment can't affect the control. And so in this study, when they say 400%, what that was looking at was these things called response ratios um, or density ratios, sometimes called. And the idea here is basically you go and you measure biomass densities inside of a marine protected area. You then find what um, you term a suitable ecological control outside the marine protected area, and you measure biomass density there, and you compare the two, right? So, you know, if the biomass density was, you know, two inside the reserve and one outside the reserve, the response ratio, right, is two, right? Or one, depending how you want to measure it. Uh, the point is, you know, a lot more. <laughs> And that's a really common strategy, right? And so it'll usually be like, a, you know, an MPA here and then, you know, a couple kilometers away over there, the control area, right? And so it's important to think about though, what this is actually measuring. And what I argue, and Paul Ferraro has a really nice paper in 2018 in PNAS about this, is that what this is really telling you is a measure of how different are things inside the MPA than outside, which is a very different metric than the population level effect, right? And the reason for that is we would argue in many cases, the MPA is violating this SUTVA assumption in that for a lot of these cases, when the control site is nearby, what's happening is that for kind of the exact reasons that we think we like MPAs from kind of this um, trade-off perspective, the MPAs are affecting that area outside, both by spillover from larvae and adults so that maybe a, a marine protected area that's actually producing a lot of spillover and in doing so producing a really large positive MPA effect at the population level would actually show up as a really low response rate. At the same time, if you're maybe concentrating fishing pressure really hard outside the reserve, you might end up with a response ratio that looks massive, but a negligible effect on the population itself. And so in effect, this question of in many cases, these response ratios that make up these really big values, the controls outside, it's unclear how good of a control they actually are. And so that doesn't mean that those reserves aren't necessarily providing really good protection of the areas inside there. It's just saying that that's not necessarily a good index of what's going on outside. And in this Ferraro study, um, they found that less than 50% of studies that did this kind of response ratio work explicitly controlled for even why the MPA was in a particular place. Maybe it's there because that's where the good habitat is. Less than 20% of Baki designs before after control impact mentioned kind of how heavy fishing was beforehand, basically pre-MPA fleet dynamics. And less than 10% addressed the question of how fleets may have reacted to marine protected areas. So this is not a thing that we're paying a lot of attention to. And again, this matters, right? So this is from our simulation where we now say, 
Suppose that we assume that fishing pressure that doesn't leave their areas, but in fact concentrates outside. What you can see is that, you know, those areas outside the reserve in red aren't really a control for what would have happened without the MPAs because the MPA is affecting the areas outside the reserves, both through spillover and through economic concentration, fishing concentration outside. Okay. So that's all well and good, you know, and I think, you know, statisticians and folks, you know, love to say, ah, there's this huge problem with this estimator when we all know, look, the real world's complicated, like, it's hard to go out there and measure things. How much does this matter from a practical perspective? So what we did here is we used our simulation analysis and we first said, okay, suppose that you took our simulation model and you compared, you calculated response ratios. You calculated the simulated biomass density inside reserves and now we compare that to the, um, the simulated biomass densities in the simulation that never had the reserves. Everything else is exactly the same, but just no MPA. So this is a true control. And so what we want to see, right, if we say now on the y-axis, this is the true MPA population level effect. And on the x-axis, that's that response ratio. So what we'd love to see is that this thing is a one-to-one -one line. And what we see is that, well, it's not but it does a pretty good job. And basically it comes down to adult movement, right? So really this is more of a sampling, extensive sampling design problem than like an estimator problem per se. And that basically when the fish doesn't move very much, the response ratio is kind of a biased estimator, a positively biased estimator of the true population size because you're not accounting for, you know, what's going on outside the MPAs. And with adult movement being small, something very different could be happening outside the MPAs. The bigger the adult movement is, the more kind of what's going on inside the MPA is a good proxy for what's outside. But the point is, yeah, you know, if you were able to go out and find a really good control for kind of everything except the MPA and you went and measured a response ratio, it's probably a pretty good proxy. It's a little biased in some cases, but, you know, it catches the overall trend, right? If you see a big response ratio, it probably means a big population effect, maybe not one to one. But here's what happens if you calculate the response ratio from the biomass densities simulated inside the MPA relative to the simulated amounts outside the MPA. So this is a bit more realistic. And what we see is that it's a complete scattershot, right? There's kind of, you know, a positive relationship there. But when fish move a lot, it's really easy to basically say, oh, there's no response ratio. My MPA had no effect when in fact it had a massive population effect. And it's really easy for sedentary species to say, great, my MPA is this huge response ratio. I've done a huge conservation win. Um, when in fact, it's had, had absolutely zero effect on the population. So this is a problem, right? And within that context, then let's zoom back into the Channel Islands, the system we want to look at here. So this is now, again, that same system. Uh, the gray kind of red outline boxes, those are marine protected areas, and the colors are just kind of sampling intensity there. This is just to kind of ground you in our sampling system. So what we can first look at is let's look at response ratios in this system here. And Jen Cassell has several papers looking at this. Updating these, this is what we see. So these distributions, these are the posterior probability distributions of the response ratio of uh, over time in the channel line. So what is this saying? It's, well, it kind of goes up and down, but you know, you can squint at that and kind of see a trend maybe in a positive direction where response ratios are going up, right? Biomass may, um, and sorry, these are response ratios just of species targeted by fishing. And so what we can see is that, yeah, over time, these response ratios are going up. That might tell us that conservation is, we've had a good conservation impact. But that tells us that we've done a good job of protecting populations inside the reserve. So what we did, is we used our simulation model and we paired these uh, response ratios with simulations that produce the same trajectory of response ratios and then plot the population level effect in red. So empirical response ratio in blue, paired simulation effect, population level effect in red. And the take home message here is that it's possible that those big response ratios inside the reserves mean a big population effect, but it's also possible they mean absolutely nothing in terms of the population effect. We just don't know. So the point is that just because we have this response ratio result, we don't exactly know what's happening with the population. So we tried an alternative strategy, and I'm gonna zip by this since we're running a little short on time and I wanna leave some room for questions here. But basically what we decided to do 
is instead of using a spatial identification strategy, we're going to try and use non-targeted species as a control for targeted species. And I'm going to zip past that, but it basically looks like this, right? The idea is that we want something that can at least control for unobserved environmental shocks, things we don't have data to control for explicitly in this system. And our hypothesis is that non-targeted species are a control for kind of how things would have evolved from the environment's perspective um, in the absence of the MPA. So the idea is we can basically use the non-targeted as a strategy to kind of estimate where we think the targeted species, the biomass densities of targeted species would have gone in the absence of the MPA and use that to um, estimate this MPA effect at the population level, not just inside outside, but from a total biomass perspective or a total biomass density perspective, what effect did the MPA have? Um, there's a lot of assumptions required here. We can talk about those in questions. So, the data themselves here, right, these are uh, visual sur transect surveys, so divers going out, counting, IDing fish, and translating that to biomasses. And these are the data that we're playing with here. So we've got um, a bunch of observations of non-targeted species like senorita and blacksmith, and then a bunch of observations of things like kelp bass and California sheephead. And looking at the data here, this is what we see. So focus in on the darker lines here. This is the centered and scale, just kind of trajectories of mean total biomass density over time. And the MPAs went in place in 2003. So what you can kind of see here on the top bar, this is everywhere and the two panels on the bottom that's outside the MPAs and then inside the MPAs. So what you can kind of see here is that first, the idea that the non-targeted species might be a useful control for kind of the trajectory of the population of the targeted species in the absence of MPAs doesn't seem crazy. They kind of seem to follow similar overall trajectories. We can also see that if you just look at the targeted, it kind of looked like things were taking off positively for a while there, which the model, once you do all the statistical voodoo, might pick up as a positive MPA effect. But you can also see that it kind of, at least just looking at the raw data, seems to disappear over time. So that's just looking at the data themselves, though. What happens when we then do a bunch of statistical voodoo to um, basically run this difference in difference estimation strategy and try and estimate what we hope is the causal effect of marine protected areas, these marine protected areas in the Channel Islands on the biomass densities of targeted finfish throughout the entire population. And what we see is this. So what we're looking at here, we do this estimation in kind of three-year chunks. And in the background there, what you're seeing are, from our simulation model, four situations that look a lot like the Channel Islands. What would we expect to happen? And so that dashed line is basically saying, well, for a lot of simulations, for things that looked like the Channel Islands, we got a pretty small effect size. But biggish effect sizes on up to well above 50% are entirely plausible given this system. Right Now, what we're looking at the distributions here, these are the, the estimates of the population level effect of the MPAs on biomass densities of targeted finfish um, with all the causal assumptions that go with that. And so what you can see is that for those kind of first um, what is, oh, nine years there, right, it kind of looks like we might hope and expect, right? No effect at first, and then kind of this gradual effect going up. And the gray area is the posterior probability distribution of the estimated effect. The red is just kind of showing the, uh, the interquartiles there, right? And so what you can see is that great by 29, 2012, you know, if you looked at the raw data, no big shock there. The model estimates that these MPAs had, you know, probably about a 75% increase in um, biomass densities of targeted finfish relative to what we would have expected at the population level without the MPA. You know, with a wide range there on down to, you know, about, you know, what is that 25%, but a pretty positive range. But then we see that those effects disappeared over the last two years. And, you know, for the fun part, when I first started running this thing, I only had data going up to 2012, 2013. So it was like, yes, we got a clear effect here. And then we added more data in and it disappeared. So to put it bluntly, what gives? So why did this MPA effect disappear? Well, one possibility is maybe we were in that constant catch scenario that caused maybe a net conservation loss, like we see there's some data supporting the data. And we see that's not necessarily the case. Um, 
these are centered and scaled catches of the, some of the targeted species in the region. And we can see that for some of these species, there's some constant catch going on, but you know, sheephead has gone down a bunch, and that's by far some of the biggest catches in the area. Others have gone up a ton. So constant catch isn't a possibility, but maybe fishing just got a lot heavier, you know, for things like blue rockfish and copper rockfish in the years kind of that we're looking at here. And we can't really control for that. And that might be part of what's driving things down. Another possibility though, is that the environment played a bit of a trick on us here. So this is again looking inside, outside the MPA on the left hand side there and inside the MPA on the right. And what's interesting is you see that same downward trajectory both inside and outside, right? But we saw from those response ratios earlier that it looks like the MPAs are providing protection relative to the area outside. So it's not that the MPAs aren't working at all, but it's just that when we look at the total trends in the biomasses, you know, they've got a higher intercept, but they're still going down. And that to us suggests that there's something environmental going on that our model hasn't been able to account for. And we hypothesize this is basically because things have been heating up in the Channel Islands like crazy, right? This is mean uh, sea surface temperature over the recent, uh, over the same time period here. And what you can take away is that it's gone up and it's gone up in particular at the most Western, you know, kind of coldest islands, San Miguel and Santa Rosa, right? So one clear possibility here is that, you know, it may be in the early years, the non-targeted species were a decent control, but in the more recent years, kind of the, it's broken down enough from the climate to kind of overwhelm the signal from the MPAs themselves. And so I actually found this tweet pretty similar to around the time when I finally got the results here and I felt it was very uh, suitable for what we're talking about here. It was a sad day. Um, so with that in mind then, right, that's kind of troubling, right? The MPAs, the Channel Islands, are about as well studied as a marine protected area network gets. And if we have to say then, well, what effect do marine protected areas have at the population level out there? The answer is, well, based on our most recent estimates, we can't really say. Uh, the response ratios show good indicates of protection inside, but they don't provide us a good estimate of the population level effect. And our, you know, our other strategy here was looked like it was kind of working there, but seems to have some issues in the latest year. But, you know, if we think about it, with the Channel Islands, what do we have? We have an area covering, you know, about 25% of the Channel Islands and marine protected areas. So even if we assume that the Channel Islands encompass the entire population of a given species, which is a pretty generous assumption for a lot of these critters, the MPA size is at max 25%. And for a lot of these fish species, we know that fishing pressure is probably moderate. And we have some decent evidence that effort displaced and didn't leave. So on the whole, our simulation results suggest that, yeah, a smallish effect size <coughs> isn't all that crazy here. And so we shouldn't maybe be surprised that it's able to be overwhelmed by things like increasing temperature along with just all the noise and sampling. And to drive that home, we again turned to our simulation model one more time here. And what we did is we simulated the kinds of data that we use in our analysis and then fit our estimation model, that difference in difference model, and then it tried to compare the true population level effect to the estimated one. And what you can see here is that when the MPA, when the, when the true population level effect is less than like 25 to 30%, across our simulations, it was really hard to get that thing right. The mean absolute percent error was pretty close to 50% um, for the regressions. And that's in simulation world, right? Not until you get to a really big effect size that once you account for, errors and variables and you know, noise and recruitment and all these environmental things that you're really able to dig in to detect these things, right? And so what this tells us is going back to the simulation result, if we think that, well, a lot of MPAs are probably about that 25%, you really have to be in a situation where things are really overfished in the first place before you might expect to be able to detect a population level effect clearly. So, with that all in mind, then let's try and bring this home a little bit. What, should, what can we say about the regional effects of marine protected areas? And I focused here exclusively really on the conservation effect. So first thing I would say is that we should be prepared for small effect sizes at the population level. And I think that's really important to drive home because I think so many of the expectations around MPAs have been set by you know, these response ratio results, which again, tell us something. They, don't just, they just don't necessarily tell us this. 
But on the good news is, is that the simulation results do remind us that marine protected areas can perform best both for fisheries and for conservation when things are at their worst. So I want to remind us here, right, that we need to be really, really, really careful about interpreting response ratios or spillover studies. We see a ton of those where it's like, here's, you know, CPUE at a gradient away from an MPA interpreted as population level effects. They really aren't, and not just from kind of a, you know, pedantic statistical problem. They have some, they fundamentally miss the mark in a lot of cases. And, you know, so to and try and provide some kind of solutions to that, right, there are other alternatives. In some cases, you might be able to use targeted and non-targeted species as controls like we did here, though we see that there are clear problems with that. You might be able to use strategies called synthetic controls to kind of simulate an appropriate control species, though it's pretty tricky to do that well in an ecological system. I think this is a new field um, from econometrics mostly. And there's clear things like structural monitoring, like um, the Nichols um, paper that came out recently that did a very nice job of kind of using marine protected area to kind of look at the thing we really care about, which is, you know, what happened to fishing mortality rates over time. It doesn't necessarily tell you the causal effect of the MPAs on that fishing mortality, but it can at least tell you, are you doing, you know, is the MPA associated with the fishing mortality rate that you want? Okay, so to bring it all home here and leave a little bit of time for questions, um, I want to really drive home here that marine protected areas really can be an important part of the marine management toolbox. I hope I didn't come across as kind of too negative here. And what I've been focusing on here is kind of this problem of how do we estimate effects? And putting that in the context that at the population level, we might expect really variable effects and potentially small effects, which make it hard to detect. But that doesn't mean they can't be really beneficial, right? And I think one of the things that we lose sight of a lot is that relative to, you know, really targeted fine scale management of individual species quotas and things like that, right? They're relatively cheap and much simpler to enforce. And I think we can't write that off. And, you know, in many cases, by being a blunt instrument, they might serve as a bit of an insurance policy where we say that, you know, if we get our really fancy fisheries management wrong outside, if we protect a big enough area from fishing, you know, it might be a good insurance policy for us. But what I want to drive home here is that, you know, the jury is not in on these things with regards to population level effects. And I would argue that basic theory tells us that the population level effects are likely to be too uncertain and context dependent to just kind of say, yep, we know these things work, put a bunch of them in place and set it and forget it, right? We need, we need to go out and monitor these things. And we haven't talked about that here, but the evidence for fishery effects is even less clear than at the population level effect. And that's the thing we really need to think about here. So in working with fishing communities and conservation groups and stakeholders, you know, context is critical here. And what we've been trying to do in kind of working with communities and MPA planning is right, go through this clear chain of first, before we do anything, right, what does theory say these communities should expect for the size of MPA they're talking about, for the kinds of species that they're looking for, and for critically the kinds of fleet dynamics and economic conditions that those MPAs are, are, um, are located in. And then once you've gone out and collected empirical data, put it in the context of theory. Does it make sense? If it doesn't make sense, that doesn't mean it's wrong, but it should give us pause and kind of think about what's going on there. <clears throat> and with that in mind, then it's critical that when we design marine protected areas, we do so in a way that we have evaluation in mind. We provide the funding for a study before the MPA and after. We target it towards species that show the biggest probability of detection based on models like this. And we think about, you know, what are the actual objectives that communities have from marine protected areas so that we can make sure that we design programs to monitor and track those things so that we can hopefully see if we're actually achieving our objectives and design things and adapt them as needed. So with that in mind then, my kind of take home here is that the future of MPA science needs to focus on understanding, estimating, and communicating the regional effects of marine protected areas. Right, we've done a lot of great stuff at kind of, you know, do they provide good protection outside? And that's been critical and foundational and we should still do it. But I think we need to start thinking broader about how do we think about really empirically assessing MPAs at the context of populations and fisheries. And so with that, I'll open things up for questions. I think we've got a little bit of time left. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. I know that that's a hard format to talk to yourself for a while. <laughs> it's a little um, weird, I get that. <laughs> we are getting some questions coming in. 
Um, but I want to encourage anybody else that's online that would like to um, put your questions, go ahead and type them into the chat box now and we can start working through them um, while we have time. So this first one, Dan, is um, uh, going off the shifting baseline theory. Are you seeing the food pyramids in these protected areas kind of shifting back to their more natural, in air quotes, um, inverted pyramids of higher numbers of predators on top? That's a great question. Um, and I haven't looked at kind of the trophic pyramid in general, but that's thankfully literally the next slide here. <laughs> so what we did look at, right, is a question of, well, maybe an explanation, since we tried to use non-targeted species as a control for targeted species, well, suppose that those, you know, those targeted species are carnivores or piscivores, and they start to build up in biomass and start to eat those non-targeted species that are herbivores, that would really throw our estimation off. So what we did is we used this technique called convergent cross-mapping, which is this, um, you've probably seen a bunch of papers from Sugihara's lab on this, basically to try and estimate whether or not there's any signal of an effect of carnivores on herbivores or herbivores on carnivores for the time period that we've got. And the short answer is we don't detect anything yet. Now in the long term, there has to be some effect. I'm not saying there's not, but what we're saying is within the time frame of the model here, we're not detecting any clear kind of causal link of boom. You protected all those piscivores, they ate all the Garibaldi, and as such, right, you're seeing, you know, we're disguising the effect there. So I, I'm not saying the trophic pyramid hasn't necessarily happened. I don't know the answer to that. But with regards to kind of it messing up our estimation, it doesn't seem to be playing a role yet. Um, so, I don't answer that question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Very, very uh, skilled to have the slide just ready right when I asked the question. I swear <laughs> we didn't plan it. Um, I am getting another question here about, are you seeing more bycatch around these protected areas due to increased species riskness and overall biomass? That's a good question. So I don't know about bycatch. Um, you know, for a lot of these, you know, hook and line fisheries, there's not a whole lot of that. It's to keep a lot of the rockfish they're going for. I mean, if you just look at the total biomass trends over time, you know, you would actually, like if you, you know, if you just kind of looked at biomass of, let's say, targeted species before the MPA and after, you would kind of conclude that, whoops, you know, there's actually less biomass after the MPAs than there was before. And so that's why it's important to have some kind of counterfactual to say, where do we think the marine, you know, the biomass would have gone without the MPAs. And so what this seems to suggest is that if we buy this idea that the targeted species maybe at least for before those kind of the, the blob really kicked in, or a good control, we might say that, well, the ecosystem in general was just kind of heading down in those recent years there. So we shouldn't necessarily be surprised that, you know, it kind of seemed like biomass densities of targeted species were going down at that time too. So I don't know if I answered that question. Bycatch, I really don't know. Um, in terms of overall biomass densities, if you just kind of look at the trends, they're actually down relative to what they were before which you know, speaks to, again, that need for us to kind of think about, well, what's a good control for where we think they would have gone without the reserve? And you know, our results suggest that, yeah, it seemed like in those early years, they really might have caused kind of an increase in biomass relative to what would have happened without them. It's just that that effect, our, either that effect has disappeared or our ability to detect that effect, which I think is a bit more likely has disappeared. So I think, um, let's see. Uh, we have a question here about pooling the target species together in a region. Does that help balance out the overall signal or does that just make it even harder um, to see the impact of the MPA with yeah, environmental variability? Question. So, you know, we tried a couple different approaches there. So this is basically saying, you know, if you just took, this is pooling, right? This is saying if we just took the biomass density of all the targeted species, we can try and kind of break it out and say, yeah, but you might expect, you know, some targeted species to have a really big effect, some not probably in relation to, you know, some species were much more heavily fished than others. Um, the problem is it's a little tough to do it kind of one-on-one -on -one since your sample size starts to run out. Long story short, we ran it some ways kind of like that and found the exact same result. In particular, we tried to do synthetic control methods where we try to do it species by species and it gets messy and vague, but it looks about exactly the same. Um, you would not believe the number of different ways we tried to run this thing. Um, and so we went with this targeted approach to kind of say from an, you know, if what you care about is an ecosystem, right, this idea that we want MPAs to kind of overall rise all ships of just kind of biomass densities 
all targeted species, do you see a big clear effect? And the answer is, you know, in this case, yeah, not really. <laughs> All right, this next question is going to take us a little bit outside of the things that you talked about, but maybe um, can you talk about the tourism uh, positive and negative effects on MPA and how tourism has altered MPAs? That's a great question, you know, and that's yeah, a little bit of out of my area of expertise. You know, I mean, I'm a dive tourist and I can certainly say that I spend money to go dive in places, right? Um, you know, I have definitely never seen like a, you know, that doesn't mean it's not out there, like a really clear study showing, you know, here is the, you know, a good controlled, you know, causal identification strategy of the tourism benefits. But I mean, you know, I don't think there's any doubt that a well-enforced MPA that produces, you know, the, the kinds of biomasses like we saw in that video in Indonesia, right? Like I would pay to go dive in that. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> um, so there's certainly that aspect of it. Um, what was the second part of the question in terms of the tourism side? Um, just positive and negative impacts. Yeah, um, you know, and, and I, I know that some MPs. folks like the Galapagos, I know, has kind of tiers of marine protected areas where they've actually considered the possible negative effects of having a whole ton of divers on a system at once. And so they have areas that are both closed to fishing and closed to tourism, actually, as kind of this double MPA of really not even wanting to get kind of behavioral responses to people engaged there. And I haven't seen results out of those um, lately, but I know that's a thing that exists. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, again, you know, when we think about this question of benefits and costs, I think that's a huge thing that you need to consider there, right? Is that, you know, that can definitely be an avenue is using these things for tourism. Now, you know, I think that depends a lot on, you know, where the community is and, you know, when I talk, you know, that tiny little community in the Philippines, right? That thing is absolutely middle of nowhere. Um, it took us, you know, I didn't know how long to get to that place. Um, and, you know, the reefs are pretty, like, I would have a hard time envisioning that this place would see a booming tourism industry any day soon. Um, but, yeah, it's really, so that was a long rambling answer to say, I don't quite know. <laughs> um, to answer this next question, I think we need to go to slide 42. Can you do that for us? Wow, that's a good memory. <laughs> okay, yep. One more, 42. Oh, yeah. Um, so is it safe to assume the downward trend implies a negative MPA outcome? Um, I don't think so. I, I think, I mean, you know, I think, you know, there's anytime we start to kind of hypothesize once our identification strategy is broken down to an extent, um, it's a little risky. I think I would feel more confident in that based on our simulation results. If when we looked at the catches, we just seen really steady catches over time, our simulation results suggest that that could definitely be what's happening. Um, given that we don't quite see that, there's a couple possibilities there, right? One is that for reasons beyond the control of the MPAs, fishing pressure just picked up for, let's say, the group blue rockfish, right? And so that's not the MPA's fault, right? The issue there is that we, we no longer have a good control for where biomass densities of, let's say, blue rockfish would have gone in a world with that exact same fishing history, but without the MPA. So that's kind of a hard thing for us to, to do. Now we did include catches in the model. So it tries to control for that a bit, but you know, that's not perfect. Um, I think for me, the, this, this massive heating up is the biggest culprit in my opinion, right? And that basically this is saying that the relationship between the targeted species, which oftentimes are colder water species where the Channel Islands are kind of the southernmost part of their range, to the non-targeted species that tend to like warmer waters, they tend to be a bit more tropically fish, has broken down enough that there might still be a real MPA effect going on out there in the world. It's just that, you know, this strategy of doing it is no longer able to kind of pick it up relative to the amount of new noise that kind of that, um, the temperature effect is bringing in there, which, you know, is disappointing. And I think kind of, again, speaks to the point that in these natural systems for these kinds of effect sizes, you know, I think we need to set our expectations that detecting these things empirically is going to be tough, right? And that doesn't mean that they're not worth doing. That doesn't mean that, you know, we do a lot of things, right? You know, climate change, right? We should try and prevent it. You know, and I'm sure an econometrician in 50 years will be grumbling that, well, you know, we can't really know that if hopefully we get our act together and change things, you know, what was the causal effect of this policy or that? It doesn't mean we shouldn't have done it, right? But just in terms of, you know, setting expectations for communities about, you know, how should we say that, 
you know, if they go out there and either measure a really big effect, does that mean they can dust their hands off and go out there and start fishing even harder because things have rebounded? Probably not. Does it say that, you know, because we see a huge response ratio, should we say hooray, or that we don't see a response ratio at all? Does that mean it's been a failure? Maybe not. We need to place it in theoretical context and realize that, you know, it's going to be tough. So I'm sensitive to everyone's time, but I have one more question here that's um, a clarifying question. I think that might help others. Mm -hmm. um, can you clarify what you mean when you say range? When you say typically 25% in the reserve, is that 25% of the species total habitat under protection? Can you just clarify that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, that, that's a great question. It's kind of a tricky thing and it speaks to kind of this challenging paradigm between kind of place-based paradigms of a lot of MPAs and kind of population paradigms of a lot of stock assessments. So I think the clearest way is yes, 20, if we, 25% of the habitat of the connected biological population. So that doesn't mean like if you looked at say aquamaps and said, you know, the total area that this species could theoretically live. The idea is the area that they could live within a connected population. So if you've got, you know, area here off Baja that's good for this species and another area off Japan that's good for those species, and let's assume that there's no biological connection between those two, it's 25% of the area off Baja, right? That population that's connected around there. It's not kind of just all the habitat. And that's range is probably a little confusing for those that are used to thinking more about kind of, you know, biogeography and things like that. Nice, I think that that helps. Um, for anybody else that has questions, I think the best way to move forward due to our time is to reach out to Dan specifically. Dan, do you have your uh, contact information you can throw yes. back up? There we go. Perfect. So, yes, you can reach me quite Wonderful. a few ways. Um, and uh, for everyone who joined us, thank you so much for being here with us. We really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully you can reach out to Dan if you have further questions. Um, Dan, thank you so much for being part of our afternoon here in Newport. Um, we really appreciate it. And there's lots of folks here that are working on these kind of questions uh, with our uh, MPAs offshore here. So I'm sure that your um, talk uh, really struck them. And um, I'm sure you're gonna get some follow-up questions from them right, as well. I hope so. And yeah, happy to talk about it. Um, yeah, I can send the presentation around if, folk, if that's helpful. There's some links in there. Uh, in particular, you can mess around with the simulation model itself with the Shiny app through that link. You can see some kind of early results from this thing. And yeah, you know, please feel free to reach out. I'm happy to talk about this stuff. We're hoping to resubmit this paper um, in the next week or two. So you know, hopefully this thing will actually be out sometime within our lifetimes. <laughs> we wish you luck. Um, just a reminder as well that the presentation will be, um, the recording of the presentation will be on the HMSC website under the past seminars page and I put that link in the chat. Um, so you can check it out there as well. You won't be able to actively click on the links, but you'll be able to pause it and pull them um, if you need it from there. Um, but if you have any other questions, you can reach out to Dan. Thank you so, well, thank much, you so much, Dan. I really appreciate Dan. the invitation and uh, it was nice to See all you guys digitally, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully someday we'll actually have you come down to Newport and you can hang out with us a little bit. But for now, so happy to see you this way. All right, cheers. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. We'll see you next week, I hope. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> Bye now.